Oh, hi. <laughs> hi. <laughs> hey, everybody. This is another weird thing I'm trying out yet again. This is one of my best buddies. She actually um, trained me when I worked at the museum that some of you hear the stories about. Um, she is Birds Carnival. And we are going to talk about art, spirituality. I think I put a little bit in the description because there is a lot of spirituality within art and even the school. I don't know if you know this or not, but um, the Rider Waite tarot deck was originally illustrated by a woman that was one of the first students at Pratt. Did you know that? I'm talking to you, my guest. Oh. Hey, what the <laughs> <laughs> this is what all new to me. <laughs> yeah, so the tarot cards that we all know. I did know they, that. Yeah, they were designed by her, and I cannot remember her name. She doesn't get, she never gets any credit. She's a woman. She any credit. Yeah. yeah, because she's a woman. That's how it yeah. goes. Okay, so we do have some people in the audience here. Hi, Christine. I'm going to put people up on the screen there. Say hello. hello. And hi, Howell. Good to see you. Hey, Howell. Hey, Howell. Isn't that a really great name? That Howell. is a great name. That's the Welsh spelling of Howell. And this is Loretta. She goes by Retta. Marjorie, hello, everybody. So, yeah, tonight I'm not going to be pulling cards, but instead we're going to be talking about that energy that I say that we all have, right? And if our hands are our best wands, so to speak, remember I said that if you want to know about what is going on in your current life, you look at the palm of the hand that you write with, that you paint with, that you sculpt with, that you sign your name with. That is your current life. Your past life is the hand that you do not do that with. So that means that that's the non-dominant hand. Now, Bert's Carnival here. She is a very, very active artist within New York City. She's shown galleries um, with uh, BWAC, which is the Brooklyn Waterfront Artist Coalition. Um, she has a YouTube channel. You still do YouTube channel? You still have that? I still show my videos on there, yes. Okay, and you've also ventured into performance art and things of that nature, right? And you had a project um uh called debt dolls and you also went to the berlin alley right at, at one point with occupy yes. is, that, is that right yes so she is very much involved with the whole ideology of creativity and creating and still works in the museum so I invited her on here to talk about spirituality within art, um, ideas that were thrown at both of us, more probably, I'm assuming, because we went to an art school, the same art school. Um, the difference between high art and low art. Now, I don't know, oh. <laughs> We have a couple more people. Hi, Sierra. Good to see you, lady. Marjorie wants to know about ambidextrous people and the dominant hand. Now, did you know? Did you actually know? And I'm going to start calling you Mariah, so I hope you don't mind. But that the ex-president of BWAC, and I won't mention names because this is a long time ago, so don't worry, okay? Um, she said that she became a different person for her artwork if she were to use a paintbrush with her opposite hand that she would normally write with. 
and that that was her kind of bringing in energy from outside of her and translating it onto a canvas. So how do you feel about that kind of situation, Mariah? I mean, because with ambidextrous people talking about both hands, right? Meaning mm -hmm. you can write and draw and do things equally with both hands. What's really happening in the brain is that you are using both sides so simultaneously. So those people are the ones that are the, you know, Stephen Hawking kind of esque brainiac, you know, rocket scientist kind of people and engineers and things. So when you do what you do, are you right or left handed? I'm right-handed. Do you ever employ your left hand? I employ it a lot only because a lot of what I do involves the use of both of my hands. Mm -hmm. Like I don't um, paint or draw necessarily with the left hand. Are you getting that scrap the sound? Not at all. For some reason I'm getting a scratch. Okay. Uh -uh. You just let me know if you need any any help here. We'll figure it out. No, we're fine. Okay. Well, hi, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Okay. I think it's, it's going to be better. Okay. So, so again, um, I employ both hands because at times, you know, I'm working with a camera or I'm um, screwing something in or making um, something that's three dimensional where I need both of my hands. Mm -hmm. um, it's not necessarily something I'm maybe aware of, mm -hmm. as you would be like if you're just painting or drawing with you know the opposite hand that you normally would draw with so it's a different kind of coordination but i believe it's I believe it's that something is happening it's just not not something i'm super aware of probably okay mm -hmm. so it's so would you consider it to almost be kind of like um a completing a circuit closing a circuit you know what I mean? Like an electrical circuit, how it has to be closed. And if one wire is off, then the electric can't go to light up that light bulb. So if you are your energy and your ideas mm -hmm. are being used to construct with your hands, your artwork, then do you believe that your artwork is also giving you energy? You understand what I mean? Like a big circle. Yes. Like the, more, like the more you complete your work, the more you put into your work. Um, I didn't used to think that way, um, but now I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a different so, place in my career now, a different place in my work. And so I look at it differently. I think about it a little bit differently now. And I think that has something to do with age and it has something to do with um, life experience that plays into that. Okay. Well, we were talking just before we decided to go live because that was up in the air. Okay. Um, but before we decided to go live, are we talking about, ooh, is her name Hilda or Helga of Klimt's? I can't honestly remember, and I did not Google it. And I feel, I feel bad. I feel bad. And I mean, look it up really fast. He's going to Google it. Okay, that's yeah. good. Okay, so she and women in art, you know, when I was actually in art school, I had a uh, professor tell me, actually, rhetorically ask me, why aren't there any famous female artists? You tell me that. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's coming from a male, I take it. Yes, yes, it was obviously. It's come from a male. Obviously. Obviously. 
And um, I just sat there and I took it. And here's the thing is that just as with the tarot cards that are the standard for how much of the spirituality that is like booming right now, a woman created that artwork, but you won't see her name on the box. Isn't that horrible? She gets no credit, no credit whatsoever. A woman also helped with the Toff deck, but Aleister Crowley, we know about Aleister Crowley. So Hilda of Klimt and also Kupka and Abstract Expressionism, which is basically what I, I kind of very quickly brought up before we went live, talking about this energy that is a facet of us and working with it and putting it into a two-dimensional area, let's say if we were to make a painting or a drawing, right? Sometimes as artists, I mean, how comfortable are you in the process the majority of the time? You just want to keep at the piece that you are working on until it's completely finished? Do you feel that nag? within you to like you have to do this i have to get this done if it's something that i'm really um certain about yes like if i've cleared up all the negative energy and work through it yes if not then sometimes i have to take a break because i'll just drive myself crazy you know um Mentally, but I can't like, why isn't this coming out? You know, what is it that I'm doing wrong? Um, so once I've worked through all that negativity, sure, I have to get it done. And there, you know, I won't sleep because I need to get back to the studio because it's right there. I can't have it it's there. And I just got to get it out. Wow. Um, but it's rare that that happens. It's rare. It's rare. Okay. Yes. Then let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. Just ponder, okay? okay? Just ponder, you like that? Ah, ah, jazz hands, right? Now, um, <laughs> like with what I do. <laughs> Rachel, that later. That, that, the, trumpet, the, trumpet. the trumpet will be later, okay? <laughs> if you guys didn't know, I used to play trumpet with my dad. So that, and she knows this, so yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I will sometime, one or another, post... A picture of it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay. <laughs> but with what I do, I will be doing a reading. Okay. And I will feel like an impetus, meaning a nudge, like, hey, hey, say this. Say this. You have to do this. And it gets louder and louder and louder if I don't say it. And that, from what I do with poems and cards and being, I guess, what you would call in the claircognizant, and we could go into all this psychic stuff, right? But whatever, right? That is called getting information from spirit. So do you think that you're having to work on it, right? That, that huge push, that drive is actually a part of your energy receiving information from the collective conscious, like the spirit side of things to, to actually get that idea out there. Yes, <clears throat> I do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, I wasn't expecting such a short answer, everybody. <laughs> She's like, yes. <laughs> well, I mean, I can elaborate a little bit. Yeah, um, come on. <laughs> I want to disappoint people. Well, I do feel that way only because um, at the core of my, you know, work, the core of my, the reason I make work is um, I do it because 
it is in my small way um, my um, desire to advocate for the better of humanity. And so I'm just, you know, I'm just a, pe a speck of sand in the universe. And, but I do feel that way. I do honestly feel sincerely that way. And so um, I feel like there's like a support group there that I can't see. Mm -hmm. No, you know, they're like, okay, now, you know, we're waiting, you know, we expect something here. Like, so absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's funny that you asked the question. It's I've funny. never been asked that question. <laughs> so I didn't even read the time clip before I came on here. <laughs> hey, you didn't sign anything, so hey. <laughs> I did, people. <laughs> no, no, okay. Now, the other thing is that in the very beginnings of something called abstract expressionism, which as you and I, we, and, and maybe some people that are actually watching right now, they, how do I put this? How would you describe abstract expressionism? Um, <laughs> and under uh, <clears throat> 5,000 pages. Now, um, say abstract expressionism, there are different, ideologies, different theories, different philosophies that go along with abstract expressionism, right? And then you have the people that come in the front door of a museum and we'll see a Franz Klein and say, oh, my kid could do that. Or a Pollock and be like, oh, I can do that in my sleep. I have that on my shop floor. <laughs> that kind of stuff. I missed it this morning. <laughs> <laughs> but abstract expressionism itself as a movement, and remember, I still don't know. You were going to Google it. Hilma. Um, it's Hilma. Hilma of Clint. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and people such as Kupka, which is another abstract, early, early abstract expressionist, what they were actually doing was diving into this spirituality behind creating art and trying to understand the process. And by embracing their spirituality, they actually thought that they were making spells as paintings and as their artwork and through the years and the ages and all that and through the many art critics that it got filtered down through and going into more um, western ideology those principles behind that got pushed aside in order to make it more acceptable so I watched, did you happen to watch Christie's auction last night? It was live and it was actually on Facebook. Oh, wow. No, I didn't see it. Uh, <clears throat> you, missed, you missed something. Okay. Now, <laughs> what is your opinion of the art world right now? Not just New York. I mean, we're talking about the business of art. God. Because, you know, I know it's a big question, so let me throw this in. We have high art and low art. Low art is supposed to be like crafts, right? Like, you know, popsicle stick stuff and you know let's let's go to art class and let's you know like high school stuff and and in well at least when when i was in the school that you and i went to the college the art college um 
it was frowned upon and, and defined as a lowbrow. Whereas high art was Picasso, was Pollock, was all of that almost like <laughs> that's a whole other story, everybody. What she's doing. Oh. That it seems as highbrow. And last night when I'm watching this Christie's thing, um they spent a good 20 minutes doing a soft close on the auction for a Picasso, which was the I'm going to say it. Ugliest. <laughs> and it, it looked void of any emotion, any kind of humanity, humane link. You understand? It just looked like, okay, I got to do a painting. So I'm going to make something. That's what it looked like to me. And here's Christie's. And they are doing a soft close, meaning that they are prolonging, you know, smacking the, the gavel for more than 20 minutes. And I think it ended up at $85 million. And it was about 30 inches by 40 inches, if I remember right. And there was a Van Gogh, or Van Gogh. <laughs> I can't do that that um, they spent probably a minute and a half on auctioning off. Explain that to me. Something just did not sit right. It's like, let's pump up the numbers of Picasso and let's lower the numbers for the Van Gogh. And what I saw in the 80s, like with Jeff Koons, and, you know, when he did the basketball in the aquarium and all that, right? Um, and that sold for, what, like $20 million? And it was just a basketball sitting in an empty aquarium. That's when the art world started to get a bad rap. And... I think that everybody has kind of forgotten that and it might be heading toward that again. What are your thoughts? Are you frozen, Mariah? <laughs> I'm not frozen. No. <laughs> I'm not frozen. I actually have a great deal of thoughts on this because uh, as an artist that I've always considered my work between both worlds, between high art and low art. Yeah. And I have an appreciation for both. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, just to answer the question, like, did you ask the question, like, like what the difference is now in the art market between high and low art? I don't know. Do it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. So, so basically, you know, what I see happening now um, is, I mean, there's so many different types of art being made, right, and sold. And, and I actually don't get to a lot of the art fairs because I'm always working, you know, they're accessible here, but I never really get to see what's out there. So there's a lot out there that I don't know about. Um, but from what I have seen, definitely there's, like, been this movement of, you know, a low-brow style of art that's now being taken really seriously in high-end galleries or the high art market. Mm -hmm. But I guess what I have to say about that is that lowbrow art and has, just like highbrow art, has a historical trajectory. And lowbrow artists, um, they te they you know, technically they don't have like a an academic background. It's like they're considered to be like folk artists or outsider artists, you know, all these terms that we give them. And then you have the high arts and not everybody has 
an MFA, but there is usually some kind of academic training involved in a high artist background versus a lowbrow artist background. So the difference for me is that there's always going to be both of the types of art being made. What you see in the high art gallery, though, being called low art, it's just that it's high art gallery, high art in a low, in, a, in a high art gallery being called lowbrow art because the person that is making that has been academically trained and is informed differently when we're putting this piece together made out of popsicle sticks, Let's say popsicle sticks or pipe cleaners or glitter, versus the person that hasn't been academically trained. You might have the same materials, but it's coming from a different, different place, different energy. So for me, it's a lot of it's about the background of the artist, and it's also about a little bit about context. Um, for me, the lowbrow artist is a little bit more sincere. I'm not saying that people, I mean, I have an active training. But when they're putting together popsicle sticks and pop painters or they're using paint for the first time and they haven't been trained to do that, mm -hmm. it's like being a child. You're, you're putting it together in the most um, kind of fundamental way that you know how, like cavemen just to put a wall. Mm -hmm. You're doing it from the most you know, intuitive and central place versus a child um, and um, artists who's been, we still have that background, sure. But now we've taken everything that we've been born with and we're adding these, you know, uh, we're adding a different culture to it. So we have a different set of tools. So it's not, as, it's not that it's not sincere, it's just the um, problem solving is different. And I would say maybe there's a little bit less spirituality in the um, like the high-end gallery like artwork versus if you just go to you know um, I don't know just like in the middle of nowhere to where there are folk artists making you know, beautiful um, artisan you know objects or painting a wall still something more for me more spiritual you know um, to that approach of art making. Uh, now, where the art world is now, it's always it's always about money. Unfortunately, it's always about yeah. mm -hmm. you know um, collectors. Just you know who's who's worth the most this year, or who's worth the most this month or this week, and it's still in a very exploitative um, world for you know the artist who's putting all this energy into something. And um, at the end of the day, it's just, there's something a little bit empty in that team. And so I've never been driven to that side of the coin or that part of the art world. Um, I would like to learn to kind of navigate both at this time in my career. But it's always felt a little bit, um, I guess like imitation or something. And I don't want to say that because I have plenty of friends that are in that world. Mm -hmm. And you know, if I'm, if I'm um, defending it, which is not my, it's not what I aim to do. Um, but that's just how I perceive it. And maybe it's just a perception. And so maybe I shouldn't say that until I've actually been in that world. Maybe it's not clear. Hmm. Well, that, that actually leads me to a facet of art that, did you know that there is a huge push to kind of, um, well, back here in Ohio, a lot of schools do not have art teachers that they will hire themselves. Instead, there is a company that has art teachers, and those teachers will then go into the schools. So it's very um, sterile we will say, okay? 
Um, I I remember when I first moved back here and I was talk and I was getting my hair trimmed. I was talking to the hairdresser as one does, right? <laughs> and she said, "Why did you get a degree in art?" She said, "They don't even have that in school." Mm -hmm. And I'm like, "This is why I I went to New York." <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, but there is now this huge push of something called expressive arts therapy, where they, all the people that basically tried to diagnose the um, the artists, the high artists, you know, I mean, high art artists, right? Such as Pollock, you know, who they like to say was bipolar, alcoholic, like to focus on his life in order to understand his art because there is that facet of audience out there, right? Well, now that facet of audience is now looking at the population and saying, oh, well, maybe if I did this with my patient, I could understand them better. Or I could, you know, and so there is this, there's, how do I put this? It's strange transformation happening where almost the term low art doesn't exist anymore. Instead, it's therapy, hmm. expressive arts therapy. And then the term that would be used to replace low art is craft. And I am running into this more and more and more. And I'm like, what, what is going on? What, you know, I mean, there aren't, there's, I'm in the middle of what is going to be crossing my fingers, sending out good energy, a little boom town, okay? One of the oldest, if not the oldest in Ohio, I think it might be the second oldest in Ohio, Johnny Appleseed, hey, you know? John Chapman made his way through here, okay? But there is an art gallery below me, not open to the public, filled with art, and why? Because, unfortunately, the idea of a high art gallery wasn't introduced to this. It has not been introduced to this area yet. So it's closed to the public. Hmm. Even though it has artwork in it. So I also... Um, hmm. You only did graduate at that Brooklyn College, right? The the at Pratt. I, I wasn't gonna say the name. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Whoa. All right. I thought you were We're in trouble. <laughs> I don't have bail money for this one, okay? I don't, I don't have bail money. <laughs> but no, no, no. I just I just find it really interesting that low art doesn't exist anymore. But, but where are you hearing that? Like in what you know okay. saying like, this? There are so many um this sip and paint parties have you heard of sip and paint parties yes i have okay so that is not seen as low art okay that's seen as craft 
and having some food and wine and getting together and socializing and just having fun, okay? And also, when it comes to certain therapies and doctors and things of that nature, um, and it was actually even the subject was broached with me about expressive arts. And so I, I can't tell you as you know, I am very open. I have PTSD. So I've had therapists try to connect with me on an art level and I've wanted to smack a bitch, you know, I've really like, wanted to, like say, Shut up. <laughs> that's, not <Tell> what, <laughs> that's not what this art is about, you know, but <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. When you know, when you get in the moment and you are creating something, you know when it's going well. You know. You feel it. And it is an energy. Just as you agreed, you, you feel it, right? So, on the other hand, what do you think about people trying to because I've always wondered about Jackson Pollock. I mean, he was an asshole. No doubt about it. His personality, asshole, right? I mean, a guy that would punch a dog, uh, the things he said to Peggy Guggenheim, uh, stuff he did with Lee Krasner, his wife, who was an artist of her own right, okay? Um, what is it? about his work that makes him Jack symbolic. You know, like Well, I'll tell hey, you what it is. Go for it. It's what you don't see. It's uh, Lee it's Lee it's Lee Krasner. There you go. You know, they yeah. don't they don't what they should do whenever they whenever any major museum or gallery exhibits Jackson Pollock. Mm -hmm. They should always have Lee Krasner's work right there because okay. without Lee Krasner, there would be no Jackson Pollock. That's, That's never, right. without most of these male artists, de Kooning is the same. There will be no de Kooning. Mm -hmm. take away, you take away this massive ego and what do you have? You have this strong, elegant woman right there who was painting, you know, or making works probably better than these artists were before they were doing what they were doing. And if you look at the trajectory of their work, of these women's work, their wives, you will see that. You will see that they were probably producing, you know, Lee Krasner was probably making works very similar to what Jackson Pollock started doing and became yeah, famous yeah. for. Mm -hmm. He became famous because he's a man. Yep. You know? And um, so that that's what it is. And, and unfortunately, you know, you know, the art world is making attempts to be inclusive and to break these, you know, um, these barriers down, right? And to bring equality into, into art. That's gonna take a long time, you know? Right now, it's still, it's still very superficial. And it's, it, it's not that, that, you know, that change isn't occurring because it is, you know? But in order to, for it to really sincerely happen, you know, on a, on a bigger level, it's going to take a long, it'll take decades, you know, it'll be, it'll, it'll, it'll be a long time before we walk into a museum and we see expositions of Lee Krasner or, or Lady Cooney or, you know, name some other people first. And, and, the, and that when you do walk into a room, you're blown away. Why? Because we've been blown away with just the names of these individuals for decades, for centuries. Mm -hmm. And it's not that they're not good artists, because absolutely, you know, they they um, they they absolutely, you know, uh, gave something to the art world, and they need to be their work needs to be known and shared. Yeah. But, now, when you say that, you are talking about the artists such as the, the such male as, artists, like such as, as Paula, such as yeah. you know, my friend Picasso. <laughs> um, I have very strong things about, you know, but, you know, of course, you know, they, their contributions are major, but 
you know, you can't just focus on on half. I mean, without without Picasso's many muses, you know, a third or you know half of his paintings would never have been made. He'd be or painting. Salvador Dali with Gala. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, where's their energy? Coming from? You know, we're, I mean, not all of it's just them. You know, I'm sorry. It's not. You know, so it, it'll be a little tough. You know, probably before after we're, we're gone. Yeah. You're like, yeah. I have now, do you, do you think this is a really spicy question? Okay, I draw the last feature is. But. Do, who do you think did the Guggenheim mural? The huge painting. Who do you think did it? You don't have to answer, but it'd be nice if you answered. I don't know what you're referring to as the Guggenheim mural. Okay. Well, story goes. Peggy Guggenheim um, commissioned Pollock to do that huge, ginormous painting to go into the lobby of her building, right? And um, when Lee Krasner went to bed the night before he was to present it to Peggy Guggenheim, the canvas was blank. And she woke up and it was finished. And that was the beginning of the drip series. Like the whole drip theme. Yeah, that made Pollock Pollock. So, because before that, um, it was very figurative. Not very right. figurative, but more figurative, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning it kind of, um, if you're unfamiliar with that term, um, there would be imagery within the artwork that kind of resembled form, like, you know, human form and things that, things that you could recognize. But, um, so yeah, and she, to her grave, swore that. She never knew how that painting was completed. She never knew. She just went to bed and woke up with the next the morning and it was so went to bed with Paula. <laughs> Whoever was in that bed made that painting. That's the mystery. <laughs> now, if you look at Krasner's work at around that time, I think it was a matter of two heads are better than one. Personally, that's what I think. And, you that's know, right. come at me. Come at me. Bring it. I'm up for a fight. <laughs> Bring it. Whoever's gonna do it. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> but no, I've always thought that. I've always thought that, Mariah, about Pollock. And every time I would look at that, and like the uh, Rosa Bonner, Bonner painting, the, um, the horse fair, you know, the huge painting, right? Um, and 19th century European art, you know, the one I'm talking about, right? Rosa Bonner, yes. yes. All right, um, why isn't her name plastered everywhere? She has an entire focal point within that wing of the Met. But yet the general layperson doesn't know her, doesn't know her contributions, doesn't know anything about her. And just like um, Artemisia Genaleschi, and we could go on and on. Oh my God, I'm getting over, I'm getting. <laughs> All right, I'm getting worked up. So <laughs> let's, let's round it up back around, okay? Because you do actually have things that you are working on right now, right? Working toward something. Is that right? Or am I totally lost my mind? <laughs> I was writing on an application for an opportunity, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
All right, and it has been an hour. Would you like to still keep talking? Or would Ten more minutes. Like Ten minutes. Ten more minutes. Okay. So, what is it that if there was one thing in the art world, the entire art world, because as we know, um, every city, every culture, every person brings their own input, their own idea as to what is and can be considered art right what is good what is bad etc what would you like to see in the whole scheme or just maybe in new york city right now but what i like to see but in relation to what I mean, like any kind of changes or any kind of um Maybe sure. Yeah. Actually, I do have something that's very, um, it's a little bit strong opinions about. Is that there's quite a lot, I'm going to say it. And okay. I know, you know, my, anyways. Hey, um, hey listen, I can, I can. Let I can me take, let me take a call. Okay. Okay. I'll find a paintbrush. That's the best one. That's the best hit right there. It's got the turpentine. Mm -hmm. um, there's, and rightly so, there is an, enormous, an immense amount of political correctness in the world. Mm -hmm. going on, <laughs> oh, including, yeah. including the art world. Mm. And in a way, I feel like um, that political correctness or that need to be um hampers the um the true spirit of the artist in a way because it's becoming like more of a rational thing like not to offend people you know to be nice and i'm not saying we're not supposed to be nice of course i i want to be nice to people but i feel as if art is the one one space that you can say anything, you can do anything, because it's there in my perspective. The reason I make work is because I have a sincere belief that art can shift the way we encounter and the way we perceive the world around us. And it makes you question the world around us. I don't ever want my art to be so easy and understandable where people don't question anything when they walk away or feel anything. Mm -hmm. Even if you walk away and you're pissed off because I've offended you, that's, that's what I want to happen. Because I'm making these conscious decisions because there's something I'm trying to get at in you, the viewer. I'm mm -hmm. trying to touch something that's really deep. So you might be looking at this, but this is not what I want you to see. So I'm going to give it to you in a different way, right? Or I'm going to put a word on it. I'm going to say something so that my message or what I really want to come across goes inside of me and kind of like touches the psyche. That's a really difficult thing to do. And so that's why a lot of my art is bad. Because I can touch <laughs> Just being honest. Back to your question. Back to your question. I wish there was less political correctness in the art world right now. Yeah, I have to agree with that, but not with that. Your art is bad. It's not. I just like I'm gonna censor this out. <laughs> uh. Tally work. <laughs> That's a whole, oh, there might have to be a part two of this. I don't know. Because people are going to be like, why is this woman saying Tellywick? <laughs> I don't know. Um, <clears throat> that's a long story, everybody. <laughs> that that well, involves a restaurant. 
that involves a restaurant in Brooklyn um, and my mom of all people. <laughs> in a tally whacker. And, and an anonymous tally whacker. Yes. <laughs> Did you try the hot tea? Uh, the hot tea at that Yemen restaurant oh, was yes. off the chain. It was a oh. spiced tea. Yes. Below yes. zero, you could go in and get that cup of tea, and it, oh. it would warm you right up. It was so good. Oh, that was so good. Really, really rough. And the food was good, too, after you got past. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> After you got past what wasn't on the menu. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll, call, we'll call that entertainment. <laughs> Unwanted entertainment. <laughs> I thought you wanted to. <laughs> no, 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 no. All right. So let's back it up a little bit. Okay, so would you like to talk very quickly about any new opportunities or any kind of projects you are currently working on? Well, I was actually very fortunate enough to, um, to be signing on a very large studio space that I'll be sharing with another artist. Mm -hmm. It's going to be in Dumbo. Mm -hmm. I'm with that. This very weird opportunity came about, and I just decided to stop being so slow because usually I'm very, very slow about things. And I just said, you know what, life is short. I'm going to jump on this opportunity. So that's the first thing is now that I have this huge space to just to just uh, have fun in this year. Um, but I'm always working on something. I'm working on a little bit of my own Pearl Manifesto right now, which is something new to me because it's a uh, it's like a written manifesto um, that is about you know, why I create artwork. And sort of moving in a new direction. This made a, some, a series of artworks with um, a homeless guy, but he's not just any homeless guy. He's um, he's actually from this book, <laughs> from this novel, <laughs> from this book, <laughs> this novel called Two Six Six Six. And if you're not familiar with that novel, the author is Roberto Bolaño, who is a Chilean writer. One of my favorite uh, writers. And anyways, there's a character in that book named Ojo Silva. Well, I'm a huge fan of Coney Island. And I go to Coney Island, New York, um, on the first major snowstorm of every year. Mm -hmm. And I love to go out there and take pictures. And then just like, usually something strange, kind of wild happens. Or I meet someone random who's out in the snowstorm. That shouldn't be. It's not me. I don't want it myself. What happened is this year, <laughs> this year, I ran into Ojo Silva, the guy from this book. Wow. And he lives on the beach. Yeah. And since he, you know, since his debut in that book, you know, he just doesn't make any money. So he lives there. And anyways, you know, um, I incorporated him and, and some projects that I did recently, him and um, a few of the seagulls out there. The seagulls. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I feel like that work is a turning point. You know, it's a very, very uh, spiritual type of project. It's very personal. It's about letting go of things. Um, and confronting, you know, life head on and life experience, um, death and renewal. It's uh, so I'm working on a number of things, but those are that's kind of at the forefront right now. Now, with the studio space, mm -hmm. what grand plans do you have 
Well, you know, Rachel, like I'm the type of person that I, I, I might just get artist block for the entire year. So I'm really nervous. No, you're not. Because no. um, I don't know. I'm really, I don't know. I don't really have any grand plans. I know that I want to have you know, some, some people over to talk more. Mm -hmm. so I'm kind of setting that up for myself. Um, but really, I'm just really looking forward to kind of turning a new leaf and exploring a different side of myself that I've never explored. And talking about this energy, I know there's something there. Oh. And I'm a little bit, is this normal? I'm a little bit fearful of it. Of course. Yeah. It, it's kind of um, before we went live. Um, I mentioned, you know, sometimes we will make a piece of work, right? For, kind of from the subconscious, like you just start painting, you just start doing right. something, right? And then you're like, what the heck is that? Like, what is that? What am I doing? What is, where'd they come from? What is this, right? And it makes you, it, it, it's appalling to you that that came out of you in almost a subconscious manner. But that is a part of your energy. That is a part of you in that completed closed circuit with your hands molding, working, doing something, building something. It is a piece of you that when you take your hands away, you are leaving behind. It's like an energy imprint of you. And I think that sometimes it is scary because it's as I tell a lot of my clients, in reincarnation, right? Reincarnation comes up a lot, a lot with what I do, right? And those major situations from past lives will show up on the non-dominant hand. Let's say that, you know, that for me would be my left hand in the lines, okay? So in all those lives, everything that has happened to you, to your energy, it's braided into you, the good along with the horrific, the scary, terrible, and the wonderful and the beautiful. And if for some reason the subconscious is like, hey, we're going to do some nasty murder scene here, decapitation, all this stuff. And when you're finished with it, you step back and you're like, what in the, <clears throat> where'd this come from, right? Supposed to say that that isn't, a part of your energy, how it either feels, something that actually did happen, that you witnessed from a past life, that you maybe even participated in, which is an, even the scarier part. So there is a karmic issue as well. But I view art in any form as an energetic imprint. Because you are leaving a part of who you are, whether it be the good, the bad, or the ugly. It's a part of you. And that's why I'm so against people just erasing and just getting rid of stuff, you know? But... But that's different from, like, making ephemeral art, right? Because ephemeral art goes into the universe. Right. Right. You want to talk about manifestation now? <laughs> <laughs> Spell work, manifestation. There's a lot of that. Like, I I view a lot of, um, what's her name? Uh, Jenny Holzer. Oh, yeah. And um, even some of uh, Yoko Ono's stuff. And I know that's like, <laughs> no one likes to hear her name. But... Um, 
But um, I love you, Coop. Yeah, I. So do I. So do I. And but people just can't get over the Beatles. Anyway, I think that the word, the spoken word, which is why um, a lot of times women that were accused of being witches in, you know, like the, during the uh, 1600s, the early 1600s and stuff during the witch trials, they were not allowed to speak it's because your words are power. Mm -hmm. And just like you weren't allowed to use your hands because this hand is the receiving hand for power, whereas this hand is the giving. Mm -hmm. Whether or not you are right or left-handed, that's always the standard. That's just how it is. So that is that electrical circuit that I talk about and I have been yammering weirdly about for an hour now. <laughs> so, do you have anything that you would like to say before we stop tonight? Because you have stuff to do, lady. You got some stuff to finish. Anything you want to add? Um, I don't think so. No, you're good. Yeah, it's been it's been great though. Okay, maybe we'll have to do this again. Absolutely. When you, when you get established in the, in the other studio, maybe you could do it from the studio. That would be amazing. <laughs> do it from yeah. the rooftop. A room, a view of the entire city. There you go. Yep. And we can Sunday up there. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank and you told, very much. I told you this is just kind of the first time I've ever done anything like this. You know, ask somebody questions and do this. This is going to go on my podcast if there is anybody still here been <laughs> listening. Um, it's going to be on Spotify, and it's on um, Apple Podcasts, and it's going to be on Facebook for a little bit, and on YouTube, and oh, here we go. We had so Christine. You're very welcome, Christine. Thank you, Christine. There's so, there's so much more that we could really get into. <laughs> it's, it's a giant... It's a giant rabbit hole. Christine likes to talk about the controversial and the rabbit holes of the world. So, you know, so that's very, very gracious of you to stick around. <laughs> but thank you so much, Mariah. And you're so lucky. You know how it goes. And I wish you luck with what you have to fill out. Tonight, fill in a do Thank you. Thank you for the luck because I haven't even started it. Let's do it midnight. So. Let's do it midnight. Yes. And you haven't started. No. Well, because I learned about it late, but it's an opportunity I really want to take advantage of. So. Okay. All right. And I didn't want to cancel here. So. Okay. All right. All right. Well, Loretta is saying, have a good night. And Christine is agreeing with what I said. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll get into the rabbit hole stuff another time, Christine. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, you so much, care, Rachel. Mariah. Thank you, everybody. All right. All right. Bye bye, Mariah. Take care. Okay. All right. So, everybody, that was my friend Mariah. And there's so much in the art world that has to do with spirituality and it the conversation is as old as time truly truly is where does the idea of art come from where does the impetus meaning that spark for art come from it's an amazing idea it's an amazing concept and 
it's something we shouldn't shy away from. And it's just a shame that the art world itself has been so very much ruled by the machine and almost been commercialized, meaning that the soul has been taken out of it for the most part. Yeah, from spirit and your soul. That's right. But there is spirituality, and that's how it started. Think about the um, cave paintings, right? Lascaux, I think, cave paintings, and um, all of the different, quote-unquote, Amazonian graffiti. I think they found, like, an eight-mile strip of different, um, different just handprints and all different kinds of markings recently. That was put there not just to, like, document, but to say, hey, I'm here. And by leaving those handprints, they are leaving a piece of themselves until the end of time. Because guess what? It's how many thousands of years later, and it's still on those walls, on the cave walls, on the sides of the canyons, wherever we end up finding all of these things, right? So spirituality, the soul, the essence of who we are as individuals needs to come back into art just as much as we need to reconnect with ourselves and not shy away from it, of who we are, okay? And that's why I wanted to talk to Mariah tonight and just bring her on. And it's going to be part of my podcast, like I said, that you can hear on Spotify. And I will add some music into it. Yay! And hopefully I'll have her on again. And I will have some other people on. And we'll see how it goes. But keep the, keep the conversation going. Because... That's how the energy inside of us can express itself. It truly is. If we feel like we do not have a voice, we still have this. And we can express it. So, I bid you adieu. And thank you for hopping aboard tonight. And you'll be hearing from me soon. I will be doing a card tomorrow. And who knows? I might even show up on TikTok a little later. It's only 9.30, right? <laughs> anyway, good to see you, everybody that showed up. And you guys take care. Your energy is eternal. Smile. Smile. You can do it. And I think I even posted on Facebook. And I was so tired and I was barely awake. But I felt I had to come on here last night and say that don't remember. Just push it out of your head how many times you got, you've gotten knocked down in your life why do we only remember that and the who did what right well guess what there's the other side of it the flip side of it is that you got up every time you got back up so why not remember that that strength is in you before you get pushed before you get knocked down. If you understand how strong your energy truly is, it's limitless. So, you are loved. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>